When we hear the term movie poster, or we think about movie posters, typically what we're thinking of automatically is a poster that promotes a particular film. But if we want to go back and really explore the history of movie po posters, it becomes clear that we have to get beyond that simple promotional function of posters to think more broadly. In this slideshow, I'm going to explore the history of the movie poster and in a way that is really about trying to rethink just what that relationship is between movies and posters. Because ultimately, if we go back to the beginnings of cinema, it becomes clear that we need to do that. There's a much more complex and rich history of posters and movies together beyond just one promoting the other. So if we go back to this particular time and place, Paris, 1895, this is a place and a moment of tremendous artistic foment. As, we, as we've studied in our class, there were all different kinds of tremendous changes going on in the avant-garde in relation to painting, new emerging styles, and it's a very exciting time for art. It also happens to be the time when cinema is born, and that is movie making, but not just movies, movies as a shared social activity. December 28th, 1895 is the day of the first public screening of film, and it was conducted by these two gentlemen, Luis and Auguste Lumiere, who owned a photography company, and they also created this invention called the cinematograph which you could use to both make movies, print movies, and project movies all together. So the 1880s and the 1890s are the height of poster culture in Paris and to a lesser extent around the world in these major metropolitan, metropolitan cities like London and New York. And at this time, posters, and I'm talking here not about cinema posters because movies don't yet exist, until 1895, posters are prolific. They are everywhere. And they are also prolifically written about. They are collected and exhibited in lots of different ways. And so I'm going to talk about that culture more generally here in a second, but it is a time where we have this amazing simultaneous birth of cinema at the height of movie culture. Uh, poster culture, excuse me. So what posters might there have been at this time for movies? We actually do have a couple we can look at. So this supposedly is the first movie poster ever. And it's got, it's a pretty good chance that that's, that is the truth. This is a poster that was created to advertise that first screening that took place at a cafe on that night in December, 1895. And if we look at this poster from the eyes, our own contemporary eyes of what we're used to seeing with movie posters, it seems very odd because we're not seeing anything here that is about the content of a movie. Instead, what we see is basically a social scene with people congregating and they look like they're probably basically middle-class people that are out and for some reason, we have a policeman here who seems to be talking to a gentleman who I don't, may or may not be a member of the clergy. He's got a book shoved, shoved underneath his arm, something there. It's not quite clear what's going on. This poster is essentially just representing for us a popular event with people packed in. It's especially odd for us to look at now. Those people are not social distancing whatsoever. But you don't have to worry about that in 1895 Paris. Anyway, this is clear. Cinematograph, Lumiere, that is accurate, right? But so far as the artwork itself, it doesn't really explain what we're going to see or what that experience is going to be like other than it is an event. Now, in the context of posters, many posters at this time in the 1890s were about advertising popular entertainments like theater performances or dance halls or particular performers. So it makes sense that you would have a poster like this and for this kind of event 
because that was a common topic of poster materials. You'd want to promote events like this. So really, this is just telling us that this is that kind of event. This somatograph, whatever that might be, is something where people are in public going to get together. They're going to file in to see something. As you can see here, there's lots of people trying to get through a door to see something. Now, the artist that did this, I'm, we can actually see the name of the artist, the signature, signature there, pretty big. And the interesting thing is that apparently, from what I can find or what it currently exists, there are no other posters by this artist. This was created by an artist that didn't make a lot of posters. Instead, his name was Henri Brispol, he was known as a genre painter. And what this means is simply a painter who basically likes to paint scenes of ordinary people in everyday life. He was a well-established, successful painter. He regularly exhibited the Paris Salon and his works often were made into prints, mass-produced lithographs that people could buy easily. And if you look at this, here is an example of a lithograph of one of his paintings. And it's also from the same time, 1896, very close to that poster that he did. And this is a painting of people, men, waiting to get their hair cut, waiting for a barber. So it's ordinary life. And when you think about this in comparison to the movie poster that we saw, they're very similar. They're both scenes of everyday life. And people, actually both scenes of people waiting around to do something. So that's interesting to me. That's interesting. There's this connection here between this artist and what he typically did and what we see in his poster work. Now, after that poster, there was another poster uh, created for the Lumieres and their cinematograph. And that's what we see right here. And this is interesting. First of all, the style of the poster, the style of the art is quite similar to the previous poster, despite the fact that this is a different artist, Marce Marceline Azul. I don't speak French. I butcher French words, uh, but I'm going to do it with gusto. I will butcher French with gusto. Um, and this is much more uh, illustrative of the actual cinema experience. So we see these people, again, they're wearing similar clothes, look like respectable middle-class people, and they are having a blast watching a film. And what you see there in black and white is an actual rendering of one of the first films that was screened uh, at that famous first film screening. It is a comic short that is about a gardener who uh, gets squirted in the face by a water hose because a mischievous boy steps on the hose and the gardener looks at it to try to figure out what's going on and then the kid steps off and pow, wouldn't you know it, he gets squirted in the face. The, the funny thing is that actually that gardener was Lumiere, one of the Lumiere's gardeners and the, little, the guy that played the boy was one of their lab assistants at their, their uh, photography uh, studio. But here we go. So here we have another poster that's actually showing us this is what cinema is like, and it has an actual image from that film. So in a way, uh, this is the first movie uh, poster that actually could be said to be promoting a particular film. Though really, it's not. It's about the experience of going to the movies. Now, the interesting thing about this particular artist who made this poster is that while this poster is similar to the other one that we saw, it's not similar to his posters, but he made many, many other posters. And these are just four very quick ones that I grabbed off the web. You can see one's for absinthe, one's for champagne, uh, one's for a baking powder, it looks like, and the other is for a baby powder. And you can look at those and they're, you know, they're pretty enough illustrations. Um, but they aren't simplified form in the way that the previous one was. And I think if you look at the previous one, see if I can do that, it's clear that he is trying to make it in the same style as the other poster that we saw. If you look at those figures and then you compare them, they're quite similar versus having his own distinctive style that you would see across his posters. Now, the thing is that if we're looking to think about the history of of movie posters and going back to this beginning of cinema, it becomes really clear 
that what we need to be concerned with is posters as visual culture rather than individual artists or the importance of individual posters. And that's because there really was no such thing as movie posters as we know them, uh, that is a poster promoting a particular film, into the, until the 1910s. Uh, and that's because movies weren't just a new thing, but the films themselves were extremely short. Uh, if you're lucky, a couple of minutes long, like the, the, the gardener getting uh, water in the face. And so they were exhibited as part of a longer program. There'd be a whole series of films. When they were promoted, films, uh, they would just simply be typographic listings of titles uh, or the subject matter of films. So those could be cheaply done through letterpress rather than through the more complex and costly lithographic process of creating posters. So although film doesn't uh, line up in, in, a, in a way to have individual films uh, promoted by posters at this high point of poster culture, posters are at this time a kind of popular art like cinema will become. And that's what is really is rich, so rich and interesting in thinking about going back and looking at poster culture and the rela relationship between posters and why posters were so popular at that time, which we will see later cinema become that kind of popular art, even though it's at its very beginnings in the 1890s. So why were posters so popular in the 1880s and then in the 1890s? Why were they all over the place? Well, they proliferated after the improvements in lithography, uh, and that meant better inks and also better presses, more powerful, quicker presses to more cheaply and quickly make a lot more prints and a lot more posters. But that wasn't the only reason. It wasn't just about technology. At the end of the 19th century, we have the, the Industrial Revolution is just... Uh, waging on at a terrific rate and mass consumption of goods is becoming both possible and popular and there are all kinds of consumer commodities that didn't exist before. That is, people are buying packaged goods, things that they used to make for themselves or that they bought generically. Now those things become brands, they become products, they become commodities that you buy and the, the, you're gonna decide which ones you buy because of advertising. The other thing that happens has to do with regulation. In 1881, the law on the freedom of the press was passed, and this was essentially um, France's version of our First Amendment. Uh, and it, amongst many things, meant that you no longer had to get approval from the state or the police before printing something, including posters. And in fact, you could post posters, you could hang them anywhere, except for places where they were explicitly forbidden to be hung because there was gonna be other official notices there. So now you could make posters, you could hang them, you didn't have to get them approved, they wouldn't be taken down by the officials. And that combination of those things really leads to this huge boom and the ability to make posters. So where do we see posters? Where were they? Well, they're called posters because they were posted all over the place. Uh, this is a photograph, an Auge uh, image from Paris of a street. And if you look closely at it, you can see posters covering edge to edge all of this wall. You can even see how uh, some of the posters repeat themselves. You have the same ones posted next to each other. They're literally, literally covering everything. So they'd be on the walls of buildings or they'd also be on what are called hoardings. And hoardings basically means when uh, a building or a city block is under construction, it will be walled off with wood to keep people out, essentially. And so that is a favorite place to hang, because you can easily hang posters. You don't have to worry about covering up glass or doorways or anything like that. So that's what hoardings are. Now, the thing about posters is they were everywhere. And if you posted one, you could expect that it could be pasted over with something else just in a matter of hours. And so that created a market, not just for people who would, uh, companies that would hang posters or print posters, but would sell space on walls. 
specific spaces on walls would be leased to companies or you would pay a company and they would have their own spaces that they had arranged where they could hang stuff. So this is a whole different kind of advertising industry that emerges of, alongside posters. Here's another image to, for us to get a sense of the range of how much space and how much buildings can be covered. This is from London. Uh, this is the side of a theater. And you know, you can get a sense here of this building is four or five stories at least high, covered with all different kinds of posters from top to bottom um, greeting us. And these are going to look a lot different from what we see becoming popular as the artistic poster uh, in Paris. Here's another quick image so you can see another place you would see them is inside a railway station. Uh, again, this is a British image, but you can see, you know, wall, top to bottom, huge posters, most of them typographic, most of them name brands, right? That might incorporate art in some small way, um, but this is prior to the, these changes in lithography that would allow for a much greater artistic component to these ads. Okay, so you would see posters in public. You would also see them at exhibits. This is the really unique thing. Posters weren't just advertising, they were considered art. And they were exhibited at the time, in the 1880s, in the 1890s, at museums, at special studio salons. Uh, this is an image from the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, which had this show. These were all posters from France that were all on display here, wall to wall. Um, so you would see them at exhibits. There were also poster dealers. Um, there were journals devoted to the poster, uh, and there were also prints that you could purchase a smaller size version of the posters. And the unique thing about this is when posters were exhibited as art, they always included the brand material, the names of the brands, not just the art, but the brands themselves and what they were promoting. There was not a clash between posters as commercial art and posters as an art that can be appreciated. And I think that's really something that's really interesting for us to consider. There was not this assumed diametrically opposed art versus advertising, commercial versus art dichotomy that um, we may be used to thinking of today. So this is a terrific painting that is from 1882. And one of the ways that people talked about what the impact of the poster was on the culture was that it was turning the street into a salon or a kind of museum. Posters, posters were creating the museum of the street. And this image is from the great book uh, that I uh, listed as my source earlier on posters. It's on the cover of that book. Uh, but you can see that this painting is creating a very romanticized notion of what the street was like and what you could see. So we have this wall and we have all these posters, edge edge, very colorful. And this couple that is there and, and they're both looking intently and closely at these posters. The woman is actually even leaning in to get a better look at them. Meanwhile, there's this kid who's mending pots right next to them, right? So the idea is that you have here in the street this, this coming together of spectatorship, of art, as well as everyday life and a kid who's just trying to fix pots and make a little bit of money. Okay, so this, I said, is a romanticized notion of posters and what they made the street like. Because the truth is, this isn't at all how people would actually see posters. Posters were important because they had to actually communicate to people who weren't paying attention like this. They had to get your attention and be able to be seen and to be read, that is to be legible, from far away, from a distracted state, not like typical art. So, you know, rather than this being a limitation, what I think is exciting here is to think that posters didn't turn the street into a place that's like a museum. Rather, they changed the museum. They changed art. And when we look at some of the artists, particularly Toulouse-Lautrec, but others, we can see elements of their style and elements throughout modern art uh, more broadly that are incorporating strategies that were used in posters because of the demands of getting people's distracted attention. In other words, again, 
posters didn't turn the streets into museums. Posters changed art. Now, one interesting thing that I want to point out here is we know that this, this, this painting was not created uh, by uh, this artist going out and setting up an easel and painting something that actually happened. This is a fabrication. Those posters are four events that we know are from various different years. In other words, they never would have been up at the same time. They were also supposedly all made by the same artist, Charest, who uh, was married to a relative of this artist. So that artist was able to get access to all these posters and essentially hang them up and create the scene himself. So this is not reality. It is a really nice painting though. Okay, so moving forward now, why was it that artists and critics too embrace the poster despite its commercial nature? Like I said, this is unique and maybe we wouldn't assume that. This poster right here is an example by Charest, uh, the, the, the father of poster art uh, in, in many different ways. And it's a poster, it features his, his, his calling card, the Charette, this, this, this stylized female figure. It is selling lamp oil. It's not even for a kind of popular entertainment. This is for a brand name good. Well, why was it the artists and critics embraced the poster? One was because it allowed them to escape the formal rules of the academy and innovate. And we've heard about that from one movement to the next and one artist who stood the test of time from this time in Paris. Um, they found those, that academic style of painting to be too restrictive. They wanted to break those rules. Well, if you made posters, you had the freedom to do that and not only did you have the freedom to do that, you had to do those things because you're trying to get people's attention in this different place and for a different reason. Another reason why they embraced it was because it meant you were treating contemporary subjects. You needed to. You were portraying places that existed right then that were uh, entertainments that you could go to or products that you could buy. It was more de democratic as an art form because it was accessible to a broader public. Anyone walking the streets, you didn't have to go into a salon or a museum to see these things. And therefore, posters were part of modern life, both in terms of their subject matter and where people could see them. Another thing that made the poster attractive to artists was that they could draw directly on the lithographic stone themselves. They could sit down and with their special uh, pencil, draw on that stone, which was very different from the ways that art could be mass produced by other people, say through engraving or other uh, artists uh, copying work through making lithographs. An artist could sit down and they could create that art on the lithograph, which would directly be used on the lithographic stone, which would directly be used to produce the poster. Another thing is that these posters that they were making were clearly an improvement on the kind on the kinds of commercial posters that existed before, which were really just text heavy and did not integrate art in any way. So one thing is it was a simple visual improvement on the landscape. Now, I have this image and I'm not going to do too much in-depth discussion of these two figures simply because I'm already talking a lot and taking up a lot of your time. But this is uh, two probably of the most important if not the two single most important people in the history of, po of, of posters at this moment in time. Toulouse-Lautrec, who of course is known outside of just the posters that he made, but is well known for the significant posters, uh, particularly related to the Moulin Rouge. And Jules Charest, who I already mentioned, who is considered the father of the artistic poster. And it's, it's important here to note, I've, I've led with some numbers. Toulouse-Lautrec um, made 30 posters, which is a lot of posters. Jules Charest made over 2,000 posters. It's a whole different order of artwork, right? And he, he, that has to do with how long he was involved in printing. He was for many years. Uh, and in fact, he became the art director of a print house and he spent his days interacting with clients and artists as well as making, doing the art himself. So this is a person who his life and his art was this connection between the industrial and the commercial and the actual, the artistic. 
Um, so one of the interesting distinctions that gets made at this time is between the artistic poster and the illustrated poster. So Charest is known as the father of the artistic poster. And this difference, this is not something that art historians have come up with now. This is a distinction that people made back in the 1880s. The artistic versus the illustrated poster. Here are two examples of them. Um, and if you look, you can see, you know, both of these are attractive posters, colorful posters, but the difference is the illustrated is about a realistic representation with a traditional style versus the artistic, which we can use our shorthand to say it is a more modern style. All right. Um, and if you look at the one on the left, the Pierre Bonnard, um, you can see in the way, if you compare the hair, um, look how similar her hair is in the outline of her hair to the dress. And how the bubbles are coming out of the champagne and overflowing throughout the bottom of the poster, encompassing the text, right? This is not a realistic image. The one on the right is a realistic image of my God, look at that fabulous champagne. Look, that's funny, that's a great big glass to drink champagne. I guess you drink a lot of it if you drink out of glasses like that. And they've got three bottles there, so they're set. But again, it's not as if this art is bad, it's just that it is a realistic representation versus the artistic, more stylized. And we look at the left, look at, notice her arm, how long her arm is. This is not realism, right? Um, her look too, there is a, uh, a simple kind of sexual appeal to this look, I think, that she has. And again, the text is incorporated into the art in a way that's very different from the one on the right. By the way, the one on the right, you can, you can get this uh, from Amazon in many different formats and hang it in your house. Uh, people find it artistically pleasing, even though it doesn't fit the, what was considered an artistic versus simply an illustrated poster, a lesser form um, at the time. Now I am gonna show, here are two posters by Toulouse-Lautrec. And uh, I just quickly wanna point out a couple of things about them. These are both very, very famous posters by him. And one of the things that uh, Lautrec and his poster work as well as, as his paintings is known for is being inspired by Japanese woodcuts and their more flat colors and outlines. Um, but the thing is, that was also a style that was commonly used in posters. And we've already seen that with some of the first ones I've, I've shown you. Uh, because, again, you needed to be easily legible. People need, needed to see it quickly. And so these simplified forms made sense and the outlines also made things easier to read. The other thing that I wanna point out in this one on the left is look at how Moulin Rouge is repeated three times. This is a strategy that was used in print advertising. Um, one reason why posters were so popular was because uh, newspaper illustrations are, uh, weren't at the same level that you could do for posters. So newspaper advertisements at this point were often just type. And a strategy, a common strategy for a brand name would just be simply have the brand name listed several times in a column. He's doing that here on the poster with Moulin Rouge. He is borrowing that strategy, but doing it in a much more artistic, illustrated manner. The other, this is the other uh, poster that uh, for this famous performer, Aristide Rouen. Um, and I think you can see some similarities here in terms of the simple, um, no modeling of, uh, or, sh or shading uh, with, with the painting. It's these big uh, uh, color blocks almost. This poster, 2,000 of these were up at one time in Paris. If you just think about how, how much you know, you're surrounded, this, this art is just like omnipresent everywhere. Um, so maybe he didn't make 2,000 posters like Charest did, but this one, he got 2,000 up at once, so that's pretty good. Now, I've gone far from the movie poster, and I'm just going to finish now uh, by bringing us back. What about movie posters? Well, so uh, Edison actually invented uh, a, something called the kinetoscope prior 
to the Lumiere brothers and their cinematograph. But Edison's idea was that people would watch movies individually. They stick their head in a box and they'd see a film. After the Lumieres uh, showed that cinema could be a social activity that you would do with other people, Edison came to his senses. He invented this thing called the vitascope, which was his version of the projector, which would then allow people to see movies in groups. And thankfully so. All right. So in American context, we were a little we we had to play catch up to the French in the in this way. But I think this poster is interesting because contrary to the Lumiere poster, this is not showing us what actually seeing a movie would be like. Um, it, it, not literally, anyway, in the way that the, the Lumiere poster was. And you can see that there, the, Edison is uh, impressing upon us, or the advertisers anyway, that it's going to look as good as a painting. It's as if you're seeing a, a painting, rather than this is what you know, movies will actually be like where we see a film. So it's interesting because, again, it's drawing connections between film and art in a way that's a little bit different but this again is a movie poster not for a particular film but for his very invention the vitascope which hopefully people will go and go and see now prior to 1910 uh, as i said there weren't movie posters for individual films what there were instead were posters that were like these ones we've seen promoting films in general movie going in general or were broad enough that they could be used for different genres, you know, so they might picture something that looked like a scene from some kind of adventure film or some kind of comedy that could be used to get people's attention to want to go see movies, but it wasn't for any particular film. Individual film posters didn't really proliferate until 1910 to 1915. Uh, and this is the American context, I should say, as well. And one of the things that's interesting, though, is that, of course, very quickly, like most things, most new things that come along, there are critics of movie posters at this time. And their criticisms um, fell into some categories, which some are unique to film, but some actually echo things that were said about those posters in France that had nothing to do with movies. One is that they complained that what you saw in the poster wasn't accurate about what the film was actually about. Um, and to this day, you can make that criticism, not only of movie posters, I think, but actually trailers or commercials for movies, right? That what the trailer shows is not actually what the movie is, 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 a, is about, or um, maybe more commonly, it has all the good stuff in it, right? Another uh, common criticism of movie posters what they ha was that they, they had too much violence in them. And these images that were available public were a kind of social menace. They actually use the term lurid lithographs to describe some of these movie posters that were trying to attract people, but so critics say were promoting violence. Another, uh, which is more of a kind of style criticism, was that they were filled with really garish colors that were visually assaulting. Uh, and this was something that was said about posters uh, in Paris and, and other places in the 1880s and 1890s, that the colors that they used to get people's attention were a kind of visual assault. And even in the American context, uh, it was given for a reason why wealthy patrons didn't want to go to the movies because they objected to these really garish posters. So one of the things that happened is that individual cities actually censored not the movies themselves, which they did some of that too, but posters. They outlawed posters that were too violent, um, and they would do things like requiring a limited number of posters on the front of theaters, or they would say, okay, you can put posters outside, but you gotta put frames around them. And again, I think it's just unique to think about the extent to which um, these regulations were involved uh, around this public activity of something new that we kinda take, take for granted now. So some of those crit criticisms echo what conservative critics of the poster in France were saying in the 1880s and 1890s, that posters were a menace to society, um, particularly children or women. Uh, and in the case of the movie industry, movie posters become more standardized with the rise of the studio system, which takes place after 1915, as well as the rise of the feature film. And it's after 1915 that feature films you know, that are typically an hour or more long, 
become more of the standard. And therefore, it makes sense to go to the trouble to make posters that are going to individually promote them. I'm leaving you here with an image uh, which is a caricature of uh, a wealthy family fleeing a movie theater because they are offended by a poster. And I know it's probably too difficult for you to read, but the poster says, The Drunkard's Baby. And it has someone who looks awful. The drunkard looks awful, and he is shaking a baby. And uh, so these are patrons fleeing these crude film posters, and this is from a industry magazine back in 1913. So I hope you have enjoyed this journey back to the beginnings of cinema and poster culture in the 1880s and the 1890s, which I think is interesting because of how posters didn't promote films, but poster culture was a kind of popular art that existed prior to cinema as popular art.